this powerful force that's happening. And you, really, uh, Arshita and Rashad, you, you guys showed these amazing projects that you're bringing together global communities to attack global issues. That, that, that's amazing. And that's happening in all of these communities that we're seeing is that we're really unleashing a passion and a power in people who, you know, they want to contribute they want to be part of something and they're learning, right? Part of this is learning to be part of this economy. So without much further um, delay, I'd like to start introducing our speakers. Um, John Windsor. John Windsor is the author of best-selling book, Baked In, the CEO, of o CEO and founder of Oak Assembly. He's also the executive in residence at Harvard's Business School. Laboratory of Innovation Science at Harvard. Open Assembly provides strategic advising for organizations, people, and platforms to co-create the future of work. John is an entrepreneur. He's a thought leader and a global authority on open innovation. John Windsor has been called a true visionary and a pioneer who profoundly understands how digital disruption is changing the future of work. John has also been called a remarkably interesting person by Steve, and amongst his many interesting, amongst the many interesting things that he has done, John has a record of climbing Mount Kilimanjaro in under 12 hours. That is 50 miles round trip on 13,500 feet of elevation gain. That is no ordinary feat. Moving on to Steve, Steve Rader is the Deputy Director of NASA's Center of Excellence for Collaborative Innovation. In his role, Steve is working to infuse challenge and crowdsourcing innovation approaches at NASA and the federal government. He has managed over hundreds of different challenges with over 90% success rate. He's an evangelist of open innovation, an advocate of the passion economy and the future of work. So here we are in a two-way conference on land. It is interesting to note that Steve initiated the first two-way conference with humans in space. And with that, Steve, I'll let you take it over. Fantastic. First, let's grab the screen here. There we go. Well, first, thanks for uh, inviting me to this. this. is really exciting. Uh, I forgot you knew about the teleconference uh, in space. That's fun. Uh, yeah, I got to do that a long time ago. Um, well, we're, we're going to go really quickly through some of uh, kind of an overview of what NASA has been doing in kind of this open innovation area. Uh, and so I'll just hit on some of the highlights here. Um, as, as stated in the introduction, I work in the Center of Excellence for Collaborative Innovation. That is a, a small group that actually works within NASA uh, and across the agency. So we have 10 field centers uh, and across the entire federal government. And we run uh, the NASA Tournament Lab where we actually uh, help projects across the government and across NASA to, to understand and use open innovation, so to so use crowdsourcing. And we do that through a series of contracts and whatnot that I'll show. Um, we also work with a lot of organizations around the world, uh, really to understand what other organizations are doing in this area in both uh, crowdsourcing and open talent, uh, as well as really uh, advising them. So we actually uh, have a great two-way conversation going on with industries and governments around the world. Um, this is our toolkit. So this is what we actually use at NASA to help other projects around the agency and around the government uh, to use open innovation. And what you see here is, is a bunch of logos of companies that we have on contract or have some relationship with uh, that we can use. And if, you, if you're familiar with the space, you recognize that these are some of the best communities uh, in the world, right? Top Coder, Kaggle, Freelancer, Driven Data, CrowdPlat, Census, HeroX, Braintrust. Um, in fact, across all of our contracts, we actually have access to about 40 different crowdsourcing communities um, that represent 110 million people worldwide. So we have the ability uh, for, for a NASA project or a, a Homeland Security project or EPA to actually get onto our contract, 
uh, match up with one of these communities or multiple, uh, and then really access the latest and greatest talent around the world and to get crowds working on our hard problems. So we've done a, almost 500 challenges to date in our group. Um, most all of them are successful. And you can see here, it's not just one thing that we're trying to do. We're actually getting algorithms and software, engineering models and designs, all the way over to video and graphics. And we're finding not only is it a great way to get great products uh, as we engage people all around the world, but it actually is a, a way to tap into that passion that people really all around the world have for NASA. And we're giving them the opportunity to actually be part of our mission and be part of what we do. And so that's been an exciting uh, experiment to see. I'm just gonna flip through a few uh, algorithm challenges that we've done since this is an algorithm crowd and a data science crowd. Uh, we actually did uh, on Inocentive, we did a challenge where we actually found an algorithm, someone built an algorithm for us, a retired cell phone engineer took the math required to kind of uh, extract signal from noise and applied that to some a heliophysics problem of predicting solar flares. And we were able to get uh, go from a two hour prediction capability to an eight hour prediction capability, amazing stuff. We did a whole series of challenges on top coder around IS solar uh, panel modeling and ended up with a really amazing uh, uh, modeling system that actually was uh, better than what we had before. We've done a series of Robonaut vision algorithms uh, with top coder as well. Uh, asteroid data center, where we actually improved the ability to detect and find asteroids, uh, and actually also package that up in software that amateur astronomers can download and use to detect asteroids uh, using their own telescopes. Um, Asteroid Tracker, we have a lot uh, uh, working across asteroids, uh, looking at top coder. Again, uh, a better way to track all of these near Earth objects. Uh, looking at RFID and, and using machine learning to improve that, that signal processing needed to kind of locate items on the space station. Uh, we actually, again, we work with other agencies. So we worked with Homeland Security on their airport scanning software. Uh, where they got just an amazing result and an amazing improvement by a contest we did on Kaggle. Uh, and same kind of thing on TopCoder where we worked with, uh, oops, some agencies on detecting illegal phishing, uh, even uh, working with USAID to be able to detect using kind of State Department data where countries may be at risk for starting to uh, initiate genocide and so, and so trying to try to prevent human atrocities. So really what we've seen is there's just so many ways that data science uh, can be used to improve the world and improve what we're doing. And crowds look like they're the best way to go. And communities like yours are kind of proving that out. Um, and so this is my get off the stage chart is just that, that look, open, whoops, open is, is the future innovation is no longer optional uh, as communities like yours and others are really increasing in the capabilities and the ecosystems that they're forming uh, get really hard to do. And we, we really tell organizations, uh, if you're not engaged in the open economy, the open talent economy, the open innovation economy, you will likely be left behind because these are powerful tools uh, that we need. And with that, I will hand over to my friend, John Windsor, who is truly an amazing individual. <laughs> wow, that's, uh, that's, that's coming from you. That means a lot, Steve. Uh, I think, you know, as you saw some of the projects Steve's doing, it's just, um, I'm always in awe of uh, what Steve does and, and what the lab's doing or what, what uh, Kosi's doing. I, I think, you know, when you look at the history of the Laboratory for Innovation Science at Harvard, it came from the NASA Tournament Lab. So uh, one of Steve's partners, uh, Jeff Davis, was big you know, visionary and thinking about how do I use, you know, open talent solutions to solve big problems. So um, how's everybody doing? I, 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 got, I just got off another call from a bunch of folks in South Africa. We were talking a lot about the lockdown and COVID and, you know, just the state of the world. Um, I hope everybody's doing well. As Steve knows, I was uh, in my in my van. I like to mountain bike and stuff. And I was in the desert here in the U.S. and uh, and got a call last uh, two weeks ago from my doctor at 11 o'clock at night saying that I was positive, COVID positive. So 
Um, it was kind of a wild experience being in the, you know, being in the desert in the U.S. in a van. I guess it was a pretty good place to quarantine. Um, but uh, but I think, you know, uh, unsure times for all of us. And um, I think that's one of the real the real successes, I think, of Open Talent Solutions and what you guys are doing. Um, it just feels like we need new ways to connect great talent and especially adjacent knowledge. So uh, just to kind of highlight some of the work we're doing at Harvard. So uh, Mike Bushman and, um, and myself, uh, we, we just did a case study, a HBS case study on, um, on Deloitte Pixel. So Deloitte has been put a lot of energy into, uh, Steve has a lot of energy into using open talent solutions in really powerful ways. We just finished uh, the, the the case, uh, the A case study. The first case study is available now, but we're launching into a second case study, and I think it really is applicable. And some of the principles we're learning is really, really applies to some of the work that everybody in this community is doing and interested in. Um, so, one of the things that's happened with the Deloitte is Deloitte, you know, has had some success adopting open talent model, but yet they you know, they've tried to use open talent models to solve for their core business, which is strategy. And it's been really difficult because of all the cultural headwinds. Um, and so what Balaji Mandili, who runs the practice, really, and he, a couple of the guys on his team discovered is that, you know, there were some other places in the, in the marketplace that needed to, or that they could exploit open talent solutions. And when they looked around Deloitte, one of the things they saw was that in the data science area, that it took four to five months to hire a data science full -time, scientist full-time at Deloitte. Right, it, it needed, they needed to be vetted, they need to be found, they need to be vetted, they need to figure out compliance and go through all the you know, rigmarole of a full-time employee. employee. All the while when the best talent was hired, they would usually leave a few months afterwards. So, um, you know, what, what, he, what, what Balaji discovered that if he could use a community to really, you know, highlight and, and turn things over much, much quicker. So Deloitte made a, uh, an investment into Equify and Desperify is another community um, out there doing similar kinds of work. But what they found, what we found in our research at Harvard, they've taken that kind of onboarding time from four to five months to four to five days. And, and that those kinds of exponential uh, growth or exponential changes really helps clients solve problems. And I think that's, that's a reality. My sense is, is that we're, we're moving from a, a world of, kind of where the, the the people that are copied the most and seen as kind of the highest at the highest level in culture were knowing, you know, leaders and knowing companies, those that felt like they had it dialed. And I think there's so much uncertainty in the world right now that we're really changing over to a, a learning culture. And, and to me, in, in the context of being a learning leader and learn, having a learning culture of, as an organization means that you've got to go learn. You've got to go get outside input. You've got to organizations, or structures around you to learn the fastest. The companies that are going to succeed in the future are the ones that learn the fastest and, and, and overcome some of these issues. So um, I think we're seeing that. The other thing that I'm really intrigued with, and Steve and I have spent a bunch of time talking about, is this kind of, you know, uh, the ability for people to upskill, but not just upskill in a in a you know a siloed way. I think one of the one of the issues we're seeing is that you know there's there's all these upskilling opportunities, and there are all these work opportunities that are not connected yet. So my sense is that what we're going to see, and one of the things I think platforms like Omdina has a huge opportunity and, and can provide, you know, things to the world where, where learning and experience and work all are kind of intertwined into a, in, into create more momentum that you can go out, experiment, be a part of a community, learn some things, learn some things, be involved in work, but yet constantly learn. And I, again, it's back to that going from a, a, a knowing culture to a learning culture. So I think I'll leave it at that. I mean, we're really intrigued. Uh, you know, Kareem just finished a book, uh, Competing in the Age of AI. Uh, he, Kareem's the head of the lab. I think it's an amazing, amazing book on kind of thinking about strategy in the context of how to use AI to build a, a new operating model for businesses. Because, I, you know, I feel like what, what's, what's one of the tensions in culture right now is that, you know, we're all working in this digital age where machine learning is coming online and got so much to do yet the oh thanks steve thanks for for uh, providing the link in the chat um yet you know many of our organizations are still built in the context of uh, analog in the analog world, right and there's this inherent tension of like how do we work in the digital world 
all the while we're, we're organized in the analog world. And, and one of the things that Kareem's book does a great job of is, is talking about how do we remake the operating model so it's more of a digital and uh, uh, more of a digital uh, business model. So, so I think I'll leave it at that and uh, look forward to having a dialogue. For your thoughts, Steve. Uh, moving on to uh, our case studies, uh, Rishabh Balakrishnan will present his work with Thrash Out NGO on illegal dump site prediction with artificial intelligence. Rishabh, you're on. Hi, Nishin. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Please confirm once you can see it. Let's. Can you? Yeah, see we Okay. Yes, we can. Rish Balakrishnan. Before I begin, I would like to let you all know that I have a stammer, so you might experience a buffer in a few words beyond your internet connection. So let's get to it. We know that trash disposal is a major problem that needs immediate attention and effective solutions. According to the World Bank, most of the world's waste is sent to landfills, dumped in oceans, or being incinerated, even though a high majority of daily consumables are recyclable. Trash Out is an environmental project which aims to map all illegal dumps around the world and help citizens recycle more. So let's get to the problem statement. We have three. One, Understand what causes illegal dump sites. Predict potential dump sites and using this analysis, how can we avoid future dump sites? Two, nudging consumers to recycle trash items in the right category via an app. And three, recommending how to keep the database of dumps updated. Since the theme is collaboration, 57 collaborators from 20 countries around the world came together to work towards this cause. Let's talk data. The data provided was dump site locations users had spotted and registered onto the app. Data in the real world is rarely in one place and to understand what factors might affect the possibility of a dump site we had to web scrape and collect different features or attributes from the locations registered. We came up with the following ideas. One, looking at the population density, let's look at the nearby venues as an, as an indicator and the distance to nearest roads. We then ran a statistical city level analysis on the following six cities from different continents with the statistical Chess mentioned in the slide. Furthermore, to understand patterns for prevention of dump sites, we looked at socioeconomic indicators. More results are present in the blog, for which we will share a link to. I will not be able to cover all our findings within this time. Omdina collaborators next took on the challenge to build models on illegal dump sites to see if we can use the location information we collected to predict dump site locations. To do so, we decided it is best to also collect non-dump site locations for the model to be able to learn better. To address this, we generated our own control set by selecting a random point one kilometer away from the dump site point in any random direction, we made an assumption that this point is going to be of the opposite class. So a random point one kilometer away from a dump site point, we assume that it's not going to be a dump site. And this is a key assumption we made. We had to rapidly iterate over different models. And these are the highlights. Random forest classifier was not able to learn definitively from the data sets. Dense neural networks were overfitting on the training set. So if, which essentially means if you gave it a real world point outside of what the algorithm has seen, it was not able to give us good results. Finally, we tried out the light GBM model, 
which was developed by Microsoft and it predicts the class and it also gives us the probability of that prediction. It gave us best results with a 78% accuracy on the test set. On further analysis, we observed that the distance to nearest roads was a very important signal, helping the model in achieving these results. Now that we had a model, we used it to generate a heat map for an entire city. And that's what you see here. For the city of Bratislava, we randomly sampled latitude longitude points and fed those points to the model. What do you see here? What you see in blue, the points here in blue, are some site locations that were registered by users. And the heat map is basically a scale from zero to 100 of the predicted probability of a dump site report. As you can see, the model is doing quite well in many of these areas. Trash out is in process of adapting our technology and is implementing this for real world use. Next, nudging consumers to recycle trash items in the right category via an app, we decided to develop an image classifier. First, members looked at their own country, city, municipal websites and decided to gather recycling guidelines. From the many recycling guidelines, we finalized on commonly occurring recycling categories. And that's what you see here. We have a total of 26 categories, such as unsorted waste, cardboard, plastic. The process we followed next was we knew what categories we wanted. We then scraped the web for images based on these categories shown earlier by writing a Python utility and collected data from different sources, Agil, open image data set, GitHub repos. And we then moved on to annotation, which is labeling the image so that the algorithm would be able to understand what it's being fed. And then we had to pre-process it because the algorithm sometimes are a bit more picky. We, it needs it in a certain format. And that's what we did. And finally, we trained the model. Talking of annotation or labeling the data, this is a, another fantastic example of collaboration. 27 volunteers working together and annotating 150 images to 200 images per category. And finally, bringing it down to 20 categories after pre-processing. Really good feat to achieve. We trialed out different models such as Mask CNN with ResNet 50 and Zetectron 2, developed by Facebook versus Inception V3. As you can see, the results Inception V3 performed extremely well with an accuracy of 94%. Here's a sample of how our model predicted images electronics textile, furniture, cotton. Finally, a very important aspect of the entire project is figuring how to keep the database of dumps updated. Both trash out personnel and NGO personnel spend time and energy in communications outside the app and experience confusion about the actual dump site status. To understand the current status, we looked at how clean and valid the current database was and observed there were many entries of questionable status or accuracy, and the user engagement was not consistent. The team went into brainstorming mode and collected 16 unique ideas, which were sorted into categories and compared on scales, as you see here, of cost versus complexity and human labor versus automation. A survey was then conducted, it was used to determine the most favorite or feasible ideas among the volunteers. Top three. Granted one was dumpster proximity notification, which essentially is, it lets users know via the app when you're near a dump site that needs updating or it needs to be checked out. Two, let's make it a game. Gamification. Let uh, this helps by giving rewards to users. 
and also creates a competitive spirit. And third, it's street view detection. This helps in automation using Google Street View and the model. We can actually automate the entire process. And finally, we had to integrate all this into a final product. And that is what you see here. So this is a sample of when the user enters the street name, let's say Baker Street London, and it shows the street on the map and you can confirm the location and run the model. The model predicts this is a dumb site and it also gives you the probability of that prediction, such as probability of dumb site is 65.8%. Next, the image classifier. Users had to upload an image, get the model running, and it would say this image is bulky plastic. And then for that category, you can check out if there are regulation information. So you can select your city and see if that regulation is available. And if not, you also have the option to enter those details if you do have those details and it would reflect across the entire system. This is a summary of what we have spoken about. Thank you for your time and a big shout out to all the volunteers who made this happen. Thank you, Rishab, for showing us how using AI and technology, we can take a step towards leaving the world a cleaner place. Next up is Harshita with her presentation with uh, Solar AI and NG. Harshita will show how assessing solar installation by detecting rooftops using artificial intelligence. Harshita, you're on. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Harshita Chopra and I'm going to present a case study on one of our recent projects with NG Factory Asia Pacific and Solar AI Technologies Singapore. So the goal of this project was detection of rooftops and its crucial features via satellite images in order to facilitate solar panel installments by our partner organizations. Let's start at the very beginning. Why should you consider going solar? Apart from the fact that solar energy being renewable helps us move towards saving our environment, it is also interesting to visualize this trend, which shows how the costs of solar cells have been decreasing steadily from the past two decades. But there are some problems that need to be addressed. The outbound sales for solar Rooftop solar or the process where the selling agents initiate customer engagement from their end is difficult as they do not usually have the entire information about the requirements of the customer's rooftops. Also, the on-site assessments that are crucial to decide how solar panels would be installed on your rooftop take long hours and up to two days with costs making up to 30 to 40% of the whole. As a result, the smaller projects, which represent most of the buildings, lead to lesser sales. Solar AI technologies work towards solving these problems. They empower solar developers and installers to search for new prospects by uncovering insights through remote sensing approach and connect with building owners. This helps reduce costs of on-site assessment using artificial intelligence. Hence, the project objective was to enable solar AI to estimate the solar potential of a building's rooftop by detecting building outlines, type of rooftop, direction of the rooftop slopes, the material, the area after subtracting the obstacles. Our solution included 52 collaborators from 21 countries around the world who came together to work towards one cause. They self-organized themselves into various task teams according to their skill set and interest. With the bottom-up approach of collaboration, we presented a working pipeline, created, trained, and tested within eight weeks, and managed to deliver various outputs pertaining to rooftop features 
fulfilling and also exceeding solar AI's requirements. Here we see the flow of this project. While these tasks were completed individually by teams of collaborators, they all later came together to wonderfully merge them into one single pipeline. Starting from the first task of pre-processing, we were provided huge satellite images of Singapore Island. In order to analyze rooftops, we needed to split them into smaller tiles without losing the crucial data, that is buildings. So the team came up with a solution involving the famous concept of sliding window, which let us extract tiles in such a way that the building, which might have been partially cut in the previous tile, was fully retained in the next one, hence saving the crucial data. Now comes annotation, the base of the entire project. To let the machine learning model know what a rooftop actually looks like, we need to feed it labeled images. The traditional approach would suggest drawing each and every rooftop on images, but we found an alternative. Using OpenStreetMaps database that provides outlines of most buildings, we performed relatively easier labeling in the QGIS desktop application. The task of annotation is a remarkable example of collaboration. We curated detailed guidelines for labeling images as well as the reviewing phase. Some collaborators even came forward to create short tutorial videos to help the team learn how to do labeling in the new software. A team of 30 plus collaborators managed to annotate hundreds of satellite images which contain thousands of rooftops followed by separate reviewing phases. They supported the modeling team by delivering annotated images in three batches from time to time. Then comes the main task of detection of rooftop and its types. With numerous computer vision models revolving around the internet, we had a huge variety to test out. Here's another great example of collaboration gives the best results. With our team of AI engineers bringing in different ideas and implementing different models, we got a chance to choose the best output. These are the three well-performing models out of which we deployed the most accurate one. It is important to calculate the free surface area available to install the panels, as they cannot really be placed over chimney outlet or a dish antenna. In order to do so, we first needed to detect obstacles. We decided to explore unsupervised methods for this task as there does not exist a labeled data set for almost anything which can be an obstacle. After testing out multiple approaches, the team created a color map of the rooftop and noticed that the darker shades represent obstacles and those pixels can be used to calculate the area available. Roof material is another important factor influencing the process of solar panel installments. We again used OpenStreetMaps database, which provides various attributes of the buildings. We found that some buildings were labeled with the roof material tag. This helps create a small but fruitful data set for a deep learning model, which can classify material of the rooftops into major categories like concrete, metal, roof tiles, etc. Orientation or the direction of your roof, where the slopes of your roof face, may have a large impact on how productive the roof-mounted solar panels would be. They are most efficient at receiving sunlight at certain angles. So we face multiple challenges in this task, but with an innovative team having people from diverse experience levels, always manages to find solutions in one or the other way. Talking about some of them, the low resolution of images for detecting individual roof faces made us initially test out resolution improvement techniques, but later on, we switched to polygon estimation and direct mathematical calculations instead of traditional machine learning. Imperfect shapes of the predicted rooftops were dealt with approximation and optimization techniques. Not only this, but the lack of available references for this task online was overcome by writing our own algorithms 
for roof face segmentation. Putting all the tasks together in a pipeline required multiple meetings in order to connect the dots. We organized a sprint twice where the collaborators from different time zones mutually agreed to come together in a three hour fast paced working session. In this way, all task teams can connect with each other about the inputs and outputs while helping each other out in the technical struggles. Eventually, with all the brainstorming calls, weekly reports, and unparalleled experience of global collaboration, the team was ready with the final deliverables. In summary, our project objective of automatically identifying the rooftops and detecting its features was achieved. We delivered an automated end-to-end -end working pipeline using innovative approaches and a mix of technologies. Here, we moved steps towards achieving affordable, clean, and carbon-neutral energy. Thank you so much. That's all from my side. Thank you, Harshita, uh, for showing us certainly an innovative way of using machine learning and AI to promote uh, and increase the use of solar energy. So the next um, part of our talk is the much awaited panel discussion with Steve and John. And to the audience, please note your questions in the in the chat box. And if you'd like the um, any particular speaker to address your uh, question, please let us know that as well. So um, we're going to get warmed up with a few questions from our side and then start adding in the questions from the audience along the way. Um, so we'll start with John. John, at Open Assembly, you advise and strategize with many large companies and organizations. Uh, what practices and methodologies do companies need to embrace to co-create the future of work? Yeah, thanks. That's really great. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been, we're very community driven organization. So we're, and we're trying to really focus on being a learning organization, but what we've learned is that, you know, a lot of times, and a lot of it's out of the research um, that we've done at Harvard, a lot of times, you know, traditional organizations or incumbent organizations have a very difficult time, not because uh, these new technologies like open talent models and AI are, you know, are kind of, you, you don't know how to fit them in, but it, they really are so disruptive to threaten the actual identity for a lot of people. Excuse me for one second, here we go. Uh, so people's identity are threatened. If somebody, like Steve pointed out, if somebody out of house can you know, have four times more you know, success on predicting sunspots, it's really threatening if you've been spent a lifetime or, or a, a career trying to do that in, in house. And so I think those are some of the things we're trying to figure out. We feel like there's a kind of a four step process. One is you need to start with a learning module, learn, work with platforms, figure out what opportunities there are uh, in that, you know, how do you taskify the work? I'm thinking about uh, not just trying to say, okay, I've got a problem. I need to assign a team to that problem, hire somebody to lead that team. Instead of saying, hey, let's taskify the problem. What are the tasks that need to be completed to solve that? What, what's the best way to address that? Is it an AI solution? Is it an open talent solution? Is it a team that already exists inside our, our organization? That's the first step. And the second step we really recommend is to experiment. You know, how do you start experimenting, playing with different platforms, trying to solve things in new ways, not worrying so much about the outcome, but just the experience of learning and experimenting. Once you kind of get through the experimentation phase, then we really recommend a build phase. Pick a few platforms that really work well, that can solve the problems that are uh, endemic to your industry and, and really start launching some projects and build a team. I mean, I think, you know, what Steve's done with Coasty and Steve and, and Jeff before him are spot on. The idea that they built the Center of Excellence for Collaborative Innovation is a great model for anybody to think about and use. And then once something's built, then how do you scale it? You know, how do you start really leaning in and solving bigger and bigger problems? But I would say that, you know, all of those kind of methodologies are great. And I think we, we understand that using open talent is a really uh, important step, that it's successful. It's really right now a cultural issue that a lot of companies have a very difficult time. You know, we, we, we feel like all the work we're doing these days, like today, right? Everything we do is digital, yet the way we're organized in, in, in organizations are based in an analog age. And so how do we balance those things? Like I said earlier. 
Thank you, John. Steve, a follow-up to that. So at NASA, you've conducted so many challenges to solve mission critical problems. Um, how do you make collaborative innovation work at NASA and across the federal government? I mean, is there a magic formula? <laughs> I wish. Uh, no, I mean, I think John hit on some of the cultural pushback that we get within, you know, if you think about it this way, if you're a NASA employee and you came to NASA to be innovative, but you really only get to innovate sometimes, right? The rest of the time you're kind of doing production. Uh, if someone were to say, hey, let's, let's outsource your, uh, your idea to some crowd somewhere. Like that's like taking the most important favorite part of your job and giving it away. And and so we had to come back to them and say, look, there's this powerful force that's happening. And you, really, uh, Arshita and Rashad, you, you guys showed these amazing projects that you're bringing together global communities to attack global issues. That, that, that's amazing. And that's happening in all of these communities that we're seeing is that we're really unleashing a passion and a power in people who you know, they want to contribute, they want to be part of something, and they're learning, right? Part of this is learning to be part of this economy. And so to convince our workforce is there is this powerful tool out there called open innovation, called open talent, where you can access people uh, all around the world to help. And why wouldn't you take that to help you get a better starting point, that then you as a NASA employee can go innovate even further, right? And so that's really been our mission is to try to convince projects that this is a worthwhile, valuable tool. Because for them personally, like John said, it just, it kind of feels like someone's stealing your job. But the reality is you can do your job much better when you reach back to the crowd. And we're finding this new emerging future of work where freelance is becoming where people are actually working. These open talent platforms, uh, like what you're showing here, are providing the places where people come together to make a difference, to learn. And that lifelong learning is just part of this equation of how the workforce has to work because the pace of technology is just so fast. So lots there, hope that answered the question a little. Definitely, you know, we need to work towards changing the mindset of people to kind of adapt to these things, right? And, and that's totally. what you and John are working towards. So great. Thank you for that, Steve. So the next question could, um, for Steve and John, you know, uh, either of you can start uh, with this. What are the collaborative innovation practices that would help address challenging problems and build real world AI solutions? And if you have a quick success story that you can share with us. Steve, you should lead off. You've got, you've got all these great, great case studies that are amazing. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I think you guys are demonstrating that by having a platform that kind of uh, reduces the friction of people coming together around a, a something uh, and a hard problem is important. The incentives are, are, are a, an important piece of this. So communities around the world use four different uh, main kind of incentives, gold, guts, glory, and good, right? So gold is money, and there's a lot of prize challenges out there where people are offering that. Guts are just hard problems. I would bet that a lot of the people that participate on Omdina are here because they like to work hard problems. Uh, uh, glory is, you know, people want recognition. And for some people, that's an important to have a high leader score or to have a reputation or to build a portfolio. And then good. Good is one of the main factors that gets people involved in these crowd uh, kind of data science problems and all problem solving. And you know, you just see that here, right? People are trying to actually solve global problems through this, they wanna contribute. And we see that in our NASA participation as well. People want to contribute to what they see as a noble human effort of human exploration. I would say what makes this really work is a, a good platform, right? Because you've got to have a way to communicate. But what really is the magic, I think, in data science uh, behind why crowds do so well is um, that you're really tapping into the diversity of thought that's necessary to get uh, rapid progress on these problems. In a challenge world, you're getting lots of simultaneous failure. And I know that sounds weird, but in the innovation space, it, 
failure is necessary. You have to have failure in order to find the best solutions. And so what you have happen in a contest is you get lots of people trying lots of different things. And if you guys know anything about data science, right? And you all do, it's all about lots of different options and configurations and how you slice the data and what the data is and what the attributes are. And when you run a, a large scale and get lots of people involved, a large scale project like this, you get lots of people trying lots of things simultaneously and you have your log loss score or whatever scoring mechanisms you use to help bubble up the solution that's really going to make a difference. And then you in, it, it, do the same thing to make that even better and better. So I think crowds, the diversity of thought, the, the fact that you can invite people in without having to screen them. I think that's opened up an entire new way of working where you don't have to prove anything with your CV to get into some of these projects. And we're finding that people who you never would have hired uh, if you looked at their CV, are the magic that make the innovation happen. And there's multiple stories. In fact, uh, I was just talking to uh, John Ferguson from NSF, and he said they just studied some of their crowd successes and found that when they solved a hard problem with the crowd, they would ask the the, the company, hey, what would you have hired this person? And 80% of the time they said we would not have hired them. And so the, the old model of hiring people is kind of breaking because there's all these new skills. I have no idea if I answered your question or not, but I, I certainly like talking about this stuff. Wow, that was great to hear, Steve. Um, John, would you like to add something to that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I always love Steve's stories. Steve, that was amazing. Um, I, you know, I, I think I always come at it from a, from a, a change management, culture change perspective. And I think it starts with leadership. I think it starts with the idea that leaders need to be more in, the, in that learning mode and just ask the, you know, just have the perspective of, I don't know. We don't know as an organization. I don't know. Let's go find out. Why not try something new? Those kinds of, like you said, those mental model shifts are really, really important to try new things. Instead of going around trying to find the expert in the world or the perceived expert in the world to solve some problem in kind of a knowing mindset, you know, just leaders need to have much more of a learning mindset of, I don't know, let's go explore some new ways. Let's get some input. Um, certainly, I, I, my sense is the future is going to be very much of a hybrid model, right? Where, as, as you said, you know, NASA is a great example of that, you know, the best, you know, brightest minds in the world right now, yet they still need out, out external input. And so it's an alchemy of great internal learning and internal teams with, you know, amazing base and knowledge and external teams. And I think that's, that's really the future, but, but in order to build that feature, it really takes, you know, that thoughtful leadership and allowing for the unknown to appear inside your organization. So. Yeah. Um, you know, having a just cause and the lead and the leadership to enable this um, will definitely attract people, the right people, to come in and and, and work on that problem. For sure, for sure. Uh, so, a next question for you, John. Um, can you give us a glimpse into the many collaborative models that vary across large organizations versus a smaller organization or um, a startup or an NGO? Yeah, so I, I would say, you know, I mean, Steve and I've talked about this and he hinted at it a bit, but I'm really intrigued by the fact that, you know, we, when you put the lens of passion on, right, it's like with NGOs and, and startups, usually they have a lot of passion and a little bit of, you know, uh, financial, you know, resources. Big companies usually have a lot of financial resources and less passion. And uh, in some of the research that I've done, I really feel like, you know, there, there's a really a passion gap, right? That if you look about it and you, and you apply the passion equation to the, uh, the diffusion curve, right? To, to Jeffrey Moore's, you know, Everett Rogers uh, model or, or Jeffrey Moore's kind of crossing the chasm that in the, in the early adoption and innovation side of the, the equation where the NGOs and the, and, the, and, and the startups live and individuals live, right? There's lots of passion. People are really willing to lean into, you know, use their cognitive surplus to solve all these amazing problems. Yet there's this gap. And what we find is that, you know, in this kind of 
in, in, we kind of call it, or I call it the, the passion desert that many big organizations have been so beaten down by meetings and to do's and things that are not just directly about the passionate work that you want to do, but just surviving the, you know, the organization, keeping the organization, the bureaucracy alive. Um, and I think we need to figure that out. There's a lot of work that's been done out of Oxford that's, that, that really does a great job of dissecting passion to say that it's not really about, there are two kinds of passions, right? There's, there's uh, obsessive passion and harmonious passion. And I think one of the things that's really wonderful about bringing in uh, open talent solutions and platforms is that it's a, really, it's a really quick way to infuse that passion and find really interesting passionate solutions to problems that you didn't even know existed. So certainly one of the solves of, of kind of overcoming that passion desert um, is to use open, open talent solutions. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you for that, John. Um, Steve, um, just as a follow-up to uh, what John said, how do you compare what Omdena is doing? And I think it's kind of um, tied with what uh, John just said in the collaborative innovation space versus what's um, going on with an established institution like NASA. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. Omdin is such a fascinating platform because you're facilitating collaboration, you're facilitating passion, you're facilitating people coming together around really amazing things. So you're, you're building a community, right? And you're building an ecosystem of people using digital uh, tools, right? And that's, that's kind of the alchemy that's, that's helping to get things done. And I think that's, that's what we're trying to tap into, right? We're, we're trying to find those communities where people um, are developing and practicing the latest and greatest skills, because that's, that's what we need to tap into. And so uh, we, we're always looking to try to figure out how, how do we, uh, access those people because fundamentally platforms are just sitting in between, right? Uh, and what they're enabling us to do now is to go from, you know, finding a needle in the haystack to matching us up with the people that can connect the most, right? And so it's enabling people without barriers, without the gatekeepers to come in and try to be part of something. But then the platforms are helping to connect and facilitate with low friction, the abilities of companies and organizations like NASA to actually use that and put it to bear against a problem that we need or NGOs in the case of Omdina, right? I have to also say before I finish this, Harshita and Urshab, you guys blew my mind a little bit today. Like, the level of detail and work that, and innovation that you, you and your teams, and I know it's teams uh, have done here. I think that is a demonstration of some just, I actually call it magic. I, I think the way crowds can, can, can do, like if someone were to put a dollar value on what your teams have done, and I know that's, you know, Omdina is trying to actually do this at an altruistic level, but, like literally the, you're doing things at a level that, that cost a lot of money in Silicon Valley. And, um, and you're doing it because you're not afraid to change the world. Like I'm just, it blew my mind that someone would take on the idea of not trash in this one town, trash an entire world, like not solar in one place, but solar around. You guys are taking on, and really, you're inspiring me because um, so many people around the world feel like they can't make a difference and that they can't take on a big problem, much less a global program. And you're just blowing that up. So sorry, uh, Nishreen, I had just had to say that because uh, it, it, I was very impressed. Uh, amazing. Thank I you think so those much, who man. those of us who are involved in Omdena feel the same way, Steve. So so thank yeah. you for <laughs> for voicing that for us. Um, I think we we can we we are at eight fifty nine. Uh, time just flew by. We would love to ask you and John a whole lot of more questions that we had in here, but uh, you know, thank you so much for being here for the, your terrific insights and and um, the this uh, amazing conversation. Um, so we'd like to thank everybody who joined us today as well from all parts of the world and, and hope to see you on the next Omdena day. So thank you all for joining us and hey, thanks for having me. Goodbye. It was really, really yeah. amazing. Thank you, Stephen. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Take care.